Okay, from the chapter on reactions, what I want you to uh, remember are the seven different kinds of reactions and how we can identify those. So, for example, if you're looking at a precipitation reaction, recall that precipitation reactions were those in which a solid gets generated. A solid gets generated, so you write in parentheses an S, so S is for solid, not soluble. Um, when you mix uh, two solutions, two clear solutions, so you have a solution A, you mix it with another solution B, and what you end up with um, in your reaction flask is some solid that gets generated, so some solid and some liquid. So the liquid part contains the second uh, salt. So this is a type of a double replacement reaction. Um, you can perhaps envision something like uh, maybe tin nitrate. And if you mix that with perhaps lead not lead, let's let's maybe consider oh let's consider potassium sulfide and as you can see tin is my metal so that is my cation so that is going to have a plus two charge uh, nitrate is my anion since there's a number one that means the charge on that is minus one and now you have potassium with a plus one charge because it's a group one metal, it's trustworthy. And if you think about sulfur, that's group six. And since you have a two right here next to potassium, that means the charge on sulfur has got to be negative two. So now if you have to carry out the double replacement and write down the formulas of the two products, that means you have to mix up tin with sulfur. Tin was plus two, sulfur is minus two, hence the formula will be S and S, and you're going to end up with KNO3 as the other product, and you're going to end up putting a 2 right in front of it because you have two potassiums on the left hand side and you have two nitrates. Realize I did not write it as K2NO3 twice. I did not do that. That is not going to make sense. The formula of the product will be KNO3 and you use the two to balance it out. Now if somebody asks you which one of these is um, the solid and which one is going to remain aqueous, that means which one is going to remain soluble, you know that all nitrates um, are soluble so I'm going to put an aqueous right by the tin to nitrate I'm going to put an aqueous by potassium sulfide as well because it's a potassium salt I'm going to say potassium nitrate that's going to be super duper soluble because all nitrates are soluble as well as our potassium salts and finally we have a tin sulfide which is going to be my solid so one can identify when you, once you see this we just carried out a double replacement reaction and uh, it is specifically a precipitation reaction because you have precipitation reaction because you have generated a solid from um, two clear solutions. So that is the reason why I'm calling this a precipitation reaction. Now somebody might want you to convert this uh, molecular equation into complete ionic equation and natonic equation. Let's take a look how we do that. Okay, so once again, my equation here is tin to nitrate reacting with potassium sulfide, giving you tin to sulfide, and you have uh, two moles of potassium nitrate. Now, realize I'm calling this molecular equation, and the reason I'm calling this a molecular equation is because I have expressed each of the reactants as well as the products as the complete formula, as the compound. Uh, so it's one formula unit which I'm referring to. You can always convert this into a complete ionic equations because realize that if you have an ionic solid and when you put it in water, depending on the solubility, you either get a clear solution um, or you get a precipitate. So we have to go back and refer to our solubility rules and uh, I had given you a chart in class and I do want you to memorize that for the test like I said previously. So let's, let, let's take a look how we convert um, a molecular equation into a complete ionic equation. So the rule of the thumb there is that you will need to break Anything that has AQ, the letters AQ by that, as far as the phase goes, you will break that into the corresponding ions. And anything that has a solid liquid or gas, you're going to let it 
remain as is so let's see if we can do that uh, here and the, uh, the other thing that I want you to verify before you begin doing that is uh, make sure that your equation is completely balanced and so in this case you have one tin on each side you have two nitrates you have two potassiums and one sulfur so we are good to go so let's break the uh, tin to nitrate first so when I do that I'm going to end up with tin 2 plus there's only one of that I would get two nitrates I would get two potassiums and I would get one sulfur as the sulfide and as far as the products go you're going to end up with tin sulfide tin 2 sulfide two potassiums and you would be able to break the nitrate as well as two nitrates realize I let the tin sulfide be as is because the phase was in solid that means the two ions are intact they are together they are going to remain as the ionic solid whereas anything that you are able to write it as the corresponding ions what that means is that water was able to cleave the bond between um, tin and a nitrate and hence these are existent as ions now now the second step is this is your complete ionic equation the second step is to look for the bystander ions bystander ions are also sometimes called as spectator ions and so these will exist on either side of the equation so just as in a mathematical equation you would be able to cancel these off and your remainder reaction SN2 plus aqueous plus sulfide gives you tin sulfide notice what remains as ions are the ions which make up the solid everything else cancels out this last one is your net ionic equation you should know for the purpose of the test you should know how to carry out a double replacement reaction you should know how to identify the products balance it out um, and identify as a precipitation or acid base etc in addition, you should know how to convert a molecular equation into complete ionic equation and further into the net ionic equation. The next reaction I want to talk about is the acid base, the acid base neutralization reaction. Realize this is also a type of uh, double replacement reaction in the sense that if you have, let's say, HCl, which is a strong acid, the reason I'm why I'm calling it a strong acid is because it gives up protons when it is present in solution so anything that will give protons in solution will be called as an acid and anything that will give up OH negative will be called as a base and the reason why I'm calling this a strong acid and a strong base is because these dissociate completely so let's say I have 100 moles of uh, HCl uh, each of those 100 moles of HCl is going to give you 100 protons from there and 100 chlorides as well. So realize that um, a strong acid just goes through a complete dissociation. Let's get rid of that. But I want to write down somewhere that an acid is a proton donor. So H plus will be given and an OH negative donor. Donor is going to be your base donor okay so I was talking about this reaction HCl reacting with sodium hydroxide and let's see what the products are going to be since you have a proton H plus it's a it's right on top of group one uh, look at your periodic table uh, chlorine is present as Cl negative the charge on sodium since it's a group one that's trustworthy it's plus one and hydroxide comes with a negative charge as well and so when you carry out the double replacement reaction you're going to end up with NaCl that's your salt and water and just for the sake of argument I'm going to just write it as HOH again to show you that um, um, water here has HOH bond so essentially it's an it's a hydroxide that is bonded to H plus and the reason why I wrote it that way is so that you can identify that it's the H from HCl and the OH from the base that gives you water 
And of course, if you think about it, the driving force for this reaction is the generation of water, which is in the liquid phase, and everything else is in the aqueous phase. So if one uh, wanted to do a complete ionic reaction or a ionic equation, uh, what they will need to do is A, figure out whether or not this equation, verify whether or not this equation is balanced, and secondly, just break down the HCl into H plus and Cl, break down the NaOH into Na plus and OH negative, realize you're not supposed to break it down into corresponding elements, but just ions. And sodium chloride will also be uh, broken into Na plus and Cl. Water, however, will remain intact. But that's, that's not what I want to do right now. I just want to uh, take the time to um, help you realize what a strong acid, what a, a weak acid is, what a strong base is, and what a weak base is. So, weak base. A classical example of a weak base is ammonia. And basically, ammonia, if you think about it, ammonia does not, it does not have in its structure an OH negative. So it does not actually, can, it cannot be classified um, as an arrhenius base. And that was one of the reasons, one of the problems that led Bronsted and Lowry, Bronsted and Lowry, to reclassify ammonia as a Bronsted and Lowry base, according to which anything which accepts a proton will be considered will be considered a um, a base. A weak base would basically mean that when you treat this base with, let's say, something like water. If it's accepting the bay, uh, accepting a proton, what does that mean? That means that ammonia is going to accept that proton and now generate ammonium ion. And what remains of water, which is OH negative from here, that is going to be the conjugate base in this reaction. So realize ammonia, which is basic, so this is the base that is forcing water to behave as an acid generating the ammonium ion that means what becomes of the base let's change the color what becomes of the base is called the conjugate acid and what becomes of the acid is the conjugate base so at any given point of time there will be a set of two pairs of uh, acid base systems in this case ammonia ammonium is the first one and the second one is um, water and hydroxide okay realize that if I'm carrying out an acid base if I'm studying an acid base reaction acid base reaction which is again a double replacement reaction it's a neutralization reaction in which an acid reacts with a base to generate salt and water you can do that you can study that with titration and we did a titration this last Sunday um, by definition titration can be any reaction it doesn't have to be acid base it can be any reaction but recall um, what we, what our aim is in a titration, the aim is to basically figure out the concentration of an unknown solution. That unknown solution is called as an analyte. In our case, we had sodium hydroxide as the titrant and we had an HCl solution with the phenolphthalein as the indicator. Phenolphthalein as the indicator. Um, and that Phenolphthalein, the presence of, of that compound, essentially um, enabled us to be able to view, view the endpoint. That was the whole aim of that, of, of that lab. But realize in an acid-base titration reaction, for every acid, you have a base. That means an acid cannot react with an acid. It won't give anything. Uh, you must have a base that should react with, with an acid. So um, you can carry out a titration method if you have a strong acid, weak base system. You can carry out a strong acid, strong base system. You can carry out a weak acid, weak acid, strong base system. 
but you cannot have a weak acid weak base system that will not give you good titration numbers so realize that whenever you're trying to carry out um, a titration in which you can use a strong acid such as HCl H2SO4 perhaps you can titrate it with a strong base such as sodium hydroxide magnesium hydroxide or you could use a weak base such as ammonia uh, and the reaction will still go through uh, on the other hand if you wanted to employ a weak acid in your titration so something like acetic acid, perhaps citric acid, boric acid, uh, phosphoric acid, uh, those, th those would be classical examples of um, weak acids that can be employed in a titration, but then the base will have to be strong, it will have to be sodium hydroxide. But what I want you to, um, to understand is that in an acid-based titration analysis, uh, if you have an acid as your analyte perhaps, uh, it must be titrated against a base, but it has to be a strong base, not a weak base such as ammonia. Okay, next what I want to do is I want to talk about the redox reactions. And um, in redox reactions, I want to calculate the oxidation numbers. Oxidation. Oxidation numbers. So I'll just give you an example of something, you know, some a charged uh, ion perhaps, something like... Um, PO43 negative. Okay, and I want to find out the oxidation number of phosphorus. So, how do we go about that? So, let's say that's my unknown X, and we know from class that each oxygen brings with it a negative 2 charge, and together, together means the phosphorus and these four oxygens, these together have a charge of negative 3. What does that mean? That means X minus 8 is negative 3. Or if you add 8 on both the sides of the equation, X is going to come out to be plus 5. So over here, the oxidation number on phosphorus is plus 5. Um, what that physically means, and we'll discuss this in Chapter 9 when we talk about lower structures, is... That if you take a look at the structure of the phosphate unit, it actually forms five bonds. There are five covalent bonds around phosphorus. The three negative charges come from the three negative charges on each of those oxygen atoms. Uh, but um, over here, we are taking a look at the calculation of, of the oxidation number, and this is how you do that. Uh, you can also calculate the oxidation number on something neutral, something like perhaps CO2. And suppose I want to find out for carbon. So X is carbon. There's only one carbon here, plus two times negative two. And there is no charge on carbon dioxide, so I'm just going to say it boils down to zero. And that means X minus four equals zero, or X is equal to plus four. Okay, I want to show you the balancing using the half reaction method. Over here we have copper solid plus silver nitrate, which is in your aqueous form, and that's giving you copper to nitrate in the aqueous form, and then silver solid gets precipitated in the solution. Realize in this particular case that your nitrate is basically your um it's 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 a counter ion so it's a spectator ion which is which is going to get cancelled uh, so if you think about this reaction in um, in, um, in 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 ionic terms essentially one can say that you have copper which is reacting with silver with a plus one charge and giving you copper with a plus two charge and silver gets precipitated and uh, the, the first look if you look at the reaction one might think well I have one mole of copper on each side I have one mole of silver which is on each side and so this reaction is really balanced and it is uh, I must tell you that it is not uh, so it is not balanced and the reason for that is the charge that you have on the respective ion so this needs to be balanced um, so one way to look at it is we will separate this out into the oxidation and the reduction half reactions. So notice you're going, you're bringing copper from copper to Cu2 plus, and the other half reaction is going to be silver plus becoming silver. So if you think about the oxidation numbers here, copper is at zero state, which is becoming plus two, and 
that is an increase in oxidation number. This is an increase in oxidation number, which means this is an oxidation reaction. And here you have silver, which is in plus one state, which is becoming silver zero. That's a decrease in oxidation number. Hence, this reaction is a reduction half reaction. So if you think about it, you will be able to generate copper into copper two plus if you simply add two electrons on the right hand side so that the net charge on the right hand side is also zero the same as the left hand side and likewise if you do the same thing on the reduction half reaction that means you will need to add an electron on the left hand side in this case so that the one unit negative charge uh, negates the one unit positive charge and hence you would have an electrically neutral system Realize in my oxidation reaction, I have two electron change. In my um, reduction half reaction, I have one electron change. So what must you do? You must multiply this entire silver reaction by two. And the reason you're doing this is basically so you can generate a two electron change because realize a redox is a combination of the reduction half reaction and the oxidation half reaction. That means at some point of time, we will need to add the reduction half reaction to the oxidation half reaction. So if you do that now, um, let's just make some room. If you do that now, you can see that on the left hand side, you will have copper plus two electrons plus two silver ions will generate copper two plus plus two electrons from here and from here you can see the silver coming in from the reduction half reaction the two electrons and the two electrons is going to cancel off and what remains is copper plus two silver ions giving you copper two plus and two silver let's just write that down so copper plus two uh, silver ions gives you copper 2 plus plus 2 Ag and now if you wanted to bring your nitrates back you can just say that copper plus 2 Ag and O3 is going to give you Cu and O3 twice plus 2 Ag so in molecular terms that is what the equation will will look like Okay, so let's take a look at this reaction that we just balanced using the half reaction method. Copper plus two silver nitrate gives you copper two nitrate plus two silver. Somebody might ask you what kind of a reaction that is and notice this is in the combined form. So you have the salt which is being treated with a more reactive metal. And so essentially these two are having a let's call it waltz um, and copper just come and tapped on the shoulder and now you have copper and nitrate dancing together and silver is kicked out of the system so this must be a single replacement reaction as you can perhaps identify um, it is a balanced reaction right now but somebody might ask you uh, which is the species that undergoes goes oxidation which is the species that undergoes reduction in other words what's the oxidizing agent what's the reducing agent so again in order to do that you will have to see um, you will have to see what's going on in terms of oxidation uh, numbers that's the that's the safest so recall from class that if you can find out the oxidation numbers um, in this case copper is zero in this case copper is plus two uh, silver nitrate that means it's in the combined form that must be in the plus one form and as a metal it will be zero so silver is going from plus one to zero that means it's a decrease in the oxidation number this must be a reduction reaction on the other hand copper is moving from zero to plus two that's an increase in the oxidation number and that must be your oxidation half reaction now once you have identified what the oxidation is and what the reduction half reaction is um, that's about it any species that itself undergoes oxidation so if it itself goes through oxidation that reduces other material reduces other other material around it and hence that will be classified as your reducing agent any species that undergoes reduction itself that means it oxidizes other material 
hence that must be your oxidizing agent in general you will find uh, more reducing agents on the left side left side left side of the um, of the periodic table left of periodic table periodic table and uh, in general you will find oxidizing agents more on the right side of the periodic table right side of periodic table okay I want to pick up one of the questions from your uh, gas law the chapter 5 gases because uh, I think in the review we have a couple of questions that you can then try um, so you 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 will see a couple of questions maybe in the form of a multiple choice maybe in the form of a, a you know a Boyle's law like a 1.2 point uh, numerical problem um, I want you to realize that ideal gas equation PV equals nRT what that means is so R is your gas constant value of that will be provided to you in the test 0 0.08206 liter atmosphere per mole per Kelvin what that means is that if you want to use this number then your pressure must be in atmosphere the volume must be in liters uh, number of moles of course and the temperature has to be in Kelvin at all times but realize that you can actually derive each of the laws from this ideal gas equation because all of those gas laws they essentially feed into uh, the ideal gas equation so for instance uh, let's say if you keep n and temperature the number of moles and the temperature is constant since R is a gas constant, you can say that pressure times volume will be a constant, right? And that means that pressure will be inversely proportional to volume. And what is that? That is the Boyle's law. Let's try it on another one. Let's try perhaps Charles' law. What, what is Charles' law? Um, so Charles' law on one hand states that if you keep the number of moles and pressure constant if those are constant then volume is proportional to temperature that means v1 over t1 is going to be equal to v2 over t2 so we can we can derive all the laws from the ideal gas equation and the reason why we can do that is because all of these laws feed into the ideal gas equation so i just want to pick up one of the questions from um, from uh, the review and um, you can just take a look at the answers you know um, at a later time uh, let's just perhaps pick maybe the second one so the second question is a 2.3 liter sample a 2.3 liter sample of nitrogen gas oh of nitrogen gas exerts a pressure of 5.6 atm what is the pressure if the volume is decreased so what is the pressure what is p2 if the volume is decreased to 1.8 liters so you have some system the volume of this is 2.3 liters so that's my v1 and the pressure is maintained at p1 which is 5.6 atmospheres now you're making the volume 1.8 that means you must have compressed this system you must have decreased the volume uh, so what is the pressure they're asking for the new pressure essentially uh, so basically you have v1 and p1 numbers are provided to you p2 is what is required you're supposed to use the Boyle's law in this case since you know pressure is inversely proportional to volume um, that means as you increase the pressure as you increase the pressure uh, essentially the volume is going to decrease and that makes perfect sense that is p1 times v1 is going to be equal to p2 times v2 so I'm just going to uh, substitute the numbers that I have been provided with 5.6 times 2.3 gives you um, p2 is the my unknown times 1.8 so on your calculator you should be plugging in 5.6 times 2.3 divide that number by 1.8 Okay, on my calculator, it's giving me a number 7.15555. They're both.
boatload of fives there. Um, but realize that I have only two significant figures, so I have to stick to the significant figures provided in the data. So I'm going to report this as 7.15, and my significant figure is at 5. So I'm going to report this as 7.2 ATM. Finally, I want to spend some time over Hess law. So I want to discuss one or two problems on Hess law or calculating the heat of reaction. So let's take a look at Hess law first. Um, Hess law basically states that if you have a reaction, uh, maybe something like, let's say, 2F2 plus 2H2O gives you 4HF and oxygen, okay? And you're given that there are two other reactions that, that, are, that are not really related to this one. There are two completely different reactions, H2 plus F2 giving you 2HF. And the heat change in that case is the heat L, delta H0 is negative 540, no, 542 kilojoules. And you're given 2H2 plus oxygen gives you 2H2O, the delta H0 for that one is negative 572. So both of these reactions are exothermic reactions. The reason why I know these are they are exothermic is because they have a negative sign for the heat change. Realize I'm writing these as delta H0. That means these are heat of reaction under standard conditions. That's why we have the zero on top as a superscript. So you're given two equations. Um, the delta H is associated with that. According to Hess law, Essentially, one can manipulate any number of any number of um, steps, any number of reactions, and if you are able to manipulate these by addition, by subtraction, multiplying with, with something, and perhaps generate the given reaction, then since you would be carrying out the same mathematical operation that you do on the chemical part, you will also be doing that on the heat part. Um, essentially, whatever is the delta H zero that comes out, you will be able to claim that to be for the unknown reaction, the given reaction that you have. So let's see uh, how, we can, how we can do that for this particular case. Now, I need 4HF on the product side. I have one of the equations. Let's perhaps, perhaps number it. Let's number that as 1. Let's number the second one as 2. So the first equation uh, contains HF on the product side. What does that mean? Um, that means that if I... Uh, multiply that first equation, if I multiply that by 2, so that it starts to reflect 2H2 plus 2F2 gives you 4HF, delta H0 in that case will be minus 1084, because you will have to do the same operation on the heat part as well. And now let's take a look um, at the second equation. 2H2 plus O2 gives you 2H2O. Delta H is still negative 572 kilojoules. Well, notice that in your given reaction, the water is supposed to be uh, on the reactant side and also realize that um, there is no other reaction which contains water other than the second reaction. So what must you do? What if I multiply the second reaction by a negative one? If you do that, this, another way of saying this is basically you are flipping the reaction, flipping the reaction. So what that would mean is that your reactants are now your products and the products are now your reactants. 2H2 plus O2. What happens to delta H0? You're multiplying that by negative 1. That means it is going to become endothermic. It's going to become plus 572 kilojoules. So one of my equations is 2H2O with 2H2 plus O2. The other one is I multiplied the first equation by 2. So those are my two equations. What will happen if you add these two? Okay, so I'm going to 
simply add these two equations, I'm going to end up with 2H2 plus 2F2 plus 2H2O, that's on the reactant side, 4HF plus 2H2 plus oxygen, delta H0 is going to be minus 1084 plus 572. When you work out the math for that, you're getting negative 512 kilojoules. On the reactant part, uh, the chemical part, the 2H2 cancels off from the, both the sides, and you're left with 2F2 plus 2H2O gives you 4HF plus oxygen. Is that not what the first reaction was? That was the given reaction. So we have basically carried out a mathematical operation that we multiplied the first equation by 2, and to that we added the inverse of the second equation. To that we added the inverse of the second equation times 2, and that gave us uh, the desired equation. Since we ended up doing the same thing on the heat aspect as well, my final heat change for this reaction comes out to be negative 512 kilojoules, and that is Hess law. Okay, next what I want to do is to carry out the delta H naught reaction from the standard enthalpies of formation. Recall from class that for any reaction, and I'm just picking up uh, this reaction where ammonia is reacting with 5 moles of oxygen to give you 4NO plus 6H2O. That's my balanced reaction. So make sure that at any given point of time your equation is balanced. That's your first thing to check. We are supposed to calculate delta H naught reaction. We would be given, in this case, we would be given delta HF, delta H formation, for each of the reactants as well as for the products. Now, from the book, I'm looking for ammonia. The number is um, negative 45.3 kilojoules per mole. Realize that the units for the delta H formation, it's a per mole because it's the amount of heat associated with generation of one mole of the product. So for ammonia, this is a per mole number. Uh, for NO, the value is plus 91.3 kilojoules per mole. For water in the gas phase, um, we have a negative 241.8 kilojoules per mole. So this is present in the gas phase, and O is also gaseous. Everything is gaseous in this case. Um, they haven't given me the number for oxygen, and the reason for that is because oxygen is present as an element. Anytime you have an element, the number automatically will be zero because uh, that's how nature made it. You don't have to actually provide the energy in or do calculation for that, so the number you're going to use up for, for oxygen is going to be zero. And now simply set, set up your, your delta H reaction. You would say the delta H reaction is going to be the heat of formation of all the products put together. From that, you subtract of the heat of formation of all the reactants put together. So you have 4 moles of NO, so NO is 91.3. Realize this is kilojoules per mole, and we have 4 moles, so mole and mole will cancel off. To that you're going to add um, 6 moles of water, so 6 times negative 241.8. From that you're going to subtract 4 moles of ammonia, negative 45.3, plus 5 times 0. The reason, again, I'm saying 5 times 0 is because oxygen is, um, is an element, and for the element, you take the number to be 0. Now, this will come out to be um, a negative 1085.6 kilojoules on, on my calculator, and from that, I'm subtracting negative 183.6 and so when you work out the math comes out to be negative 902.0 kilojoules okay 
So heat of reaction is nothing but the heat of formations of all moles of products minus heat of formation for all moles of reactants. You have to work with the numbers that are provided to you. You have to work with that. Um, the values will be provided to you. Again, the only one that you have to remember is that the, um, if there is an element, if there is an, any element which is present as the nature made it, it's in, in its elemental form, the value will be zero. Okay, I just saw uh, this one question, um, which is not actually in your review, but I just saw that and I found it very interesting. Um, the question is, suppose you find a copper penny um, in snow, okay? You find a copper penny in the snow. How much heat is absorbed? How much heat is absorbed by the penny um, as it warms from a temperature of the snow? So the snow is at negative 8 degrees Celsius, okay? And it has to warm up to your body temperature, 37 degrees Celsius. Um, and they have given the mass of the penny. The mass of the penny is given to be 3.10 grams. And they have also given the specific heat of the uh, penny, which is made of copper. So specific heat of copper that is given to be 0 0.3.385 joules per gram per degree Celsius. So the question again is how much heat is absorbed by this penny as it warms from the temperature of the snow which is at negative 8 degrees Celsius to the temperature of your body as you're holding it, how much heat would be absorbed. So recall Q is proportional to, to mass, proportional to the temperature change. Q is equal to mc delta T. The mass is given to be 3.1, specific heat is 0 0.385, delta T is your final temperature, so 37. From that, you want to subtract off minus 8, so 37 plus 8. In other words, the temperature difference is 45 degrees Celsius. So when you work out the math, realize we are going to write this as joules per gram per degree Celsius, the gram and the gram will cancel off, the degree Celsius, degree Celsius will cancel off. Your final answer is going to be in joules. So on your calculator, you should plug in 3.10 times 0.385 times 45.0. The number I'm getting will be 53.7 in three significant figures. So 53.7 joules is your final answer. So realize, recall, Q equals MC delta V, delta T, sorry, is uh, is an important formula to remember because you will, you, you will, uh, you, you can see that. Another concept that is coming to my mind as I speak is the pressure volume work. Recall from uh, what we discussed in class, if you have some container that is uh, that is maintained at some pressure and some volume, and if you try to compress it, that means if you do work on this system, that will be a work with positive sign. On the other hand, if you work if this is an expansive system and this is expansion, that means the final volume is going to be larger than the initial volume. In that case, work will be done by the system, and in that case, it will be negative P delta V. So compression means compression means work is being done on the system, and that's plus P delta V, whereas expansion is work done by the system, and that will be negative P delta V. So so recall that. Um, so things like inflation of a balloon, a hot air balloon, those are cases of a negative P delta V. That's an expansive process where the final volume is going to be larger than the initial volume. Uh, so the delta V is going to be um, a positive number and the work will be done by the system in liter, in liter atmosphere. Um, also realize uh, sometimes you might have to convert a liter atmosphere into joules and uh, from class if you recall 101.3 joules make up one liter atmosphere however this relationship will be provided to you in the test um, on the periodic table worksheet um, so you can use that to your benefit on an as-needed basis um, 
I think that will be all for now. Um, I think I have gone over anything and everything. Recall exothermic endothermic processes. Exothermic delta H negative. Endothermic delta H should be positive since the heat is entering the system. You're doing everything from the perspective of the system. And that's what is most important. Um, we also discussed in class three types of systems. Isolated, uh, closed, and open systems. Open system is the one in which both mass and energy can get exchanged. Closed system is the one only the mass gets exchanged. I'm sorry, only the energy gets exchanged. Um, the mass does not. That remains conserved. And if you have an isolated system, then both mass and energy will remain uh will remain conserved. So in that case, one can see perhaps that if you have an insulated uh, thermos flask, uh, which is completely sealed from all sides, the water vapor is not leaving the surface of the hot, hot coffee. Um, it has the insulation and hence heat is not getting exchanged. And so that is a classical case of an isolated system. A closed cup will be when you put the lid on top of it. So the water vapor is not allowed to leave the surface. On the other hand, the, the heat exchange is going to take place because the walls are not insulated enough. And if you have an open system, that's just an open cup of coffee. And that basically means that both the mass as well as the heat are going to get exchanged in that case. So... Uh, recall all of that good information that we learned in class so going back to your lecture notes will be will be a good idea to do so okay good luck I'll see you next next week um, I, I basically spent 46 minutes over this review uh, go over the review uh, on your own and match your answers but uh, hopefully this gives you a good insight in terms of um, the concepts uh, that you are required to to know for the second exam. All right, I'll see you next week, bye.